This fall for our Bible classes, we're talking about two prophets in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. And we made it to, to week five. Now we're just to stories about Elisha. We moved on from Elijah. And it's always good for us to start out with some review. A few weeks ago, we talked about what the world was like, especially what Israel was like in, in the days of Elijah and Elisha. And so I'm going to pull up our map here and see if you can fill out the blanks that are on your study sheet. It says, God's people were split into two separate nations. Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah. We talked about, this is sometimes really confusing for us. We just think about, well, the people of Israel are God's people. That's true, but for a long period in the Old Testament, God's people were split into two completely separate countries. Israel and Judah. It says of those two nations, which one was bigger and usually more powerful? Israel. Israel. Okay, if you remember, there were ten tribes of, of Israel. How many of the ten tribes went to the country of Israel? I'm sorry, there were twelve tribes. <laughs> I kind of gave that one away, didn't I? Ten of them ended up in Israel. So how many ended up in Judah? Two. Two. Judah and Simeon were the only ones who were together, and the other ten were all together in the north. Okay, so Israel was bigger and more powerful, but which one was more important to the story of the Bible? Judah, Judah was. So why was the smaller one, Judah, more important to the story of the Bible? Because ultimately Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, and so the whole purpose of the Old Testament is to tell us the story of, of the coming of Jesus. And so Judah was more central to that. Maybe the second and lesser reason would be Judah was where Jerusalem was. And Judah actually had some kings that believed in God. Which we'd say, well, of course that should be the case. Do you know how many of the kings of Israel believed in God? None. Zero. Zero. In the whole history of the kingdom of Israel, not a single one of their kings was a faithful believer in God. For Judah and the South, I, you could you know, do the math and add them up. I, it was probably about 50-50. That maybe half of their kings were good, God-fearing men who believed in God, and half weren't. But at least some of them were. And so because of Jesus, and also because of Jerusalem and these godly kings, Judah has a more important role in the Bible story. Before we get to the next one, Elijah and Elisha, which of the two countries did they live in and minister to? Israel. Israel. So Elijah and Elisha are both living in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Elijah especially, but partly Elisha too, they lived under King Ahab. Whom did King Ahab marry? Jezebel. Jezebel. Where was she from? Phoenicia. From Phoenicia. Wow, that's impressive. That's the, that's the big name. Tyre and Sidon are way up at the top of the map, cities on the Mediterranean Sea. So she was from a different country. There we go. And what two false gods did she bring to Israel? Baal, Baal and Ashtoreth. And they kind of go together. Baal was this male god of the rain and thunder and fertility, and Ashtoreth was the female god of fertility, and she brought their worship in Israel, and it was a sad, bad thing. Everybody caught up? Could you have answered all those on your own? Yes. You could. Wow, that's good. Maybe we'll come back to it. <laughs> You've got your little cheat sheet for next time, right? Before we actually get into what we're going to study today, we want to read one story from the Bible, and it's the story of how King Ahab died. So this is not what we're going to focus on for the Bible study, but we want to read it just to end up the life of King Ahab, and it kind of leads into the story we're going to study today. So if you open up to 1 Kings chapter 22, Starting with verse 29. 1 Kings 22. Starting with 
starting with verse 29. And so King Ahab was this awful king who helped turn the people away from God. He was especially influenced by his wife Jezebel. She was also to blame. God had told Ahab and Jezebel that he was going to judge them and judge their families and cut them off. And here's how the end of Ahab's life went. And as we go through, it's clear that God is the one who was guiding what happened. So 1 Kings 22, verse 29. It says, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter through the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his 32 chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone, great or small, except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, surely this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him, but when Jehoshaphat cried out, the chariot commander saw that he was not the king of Israel and stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. The king told his chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting, I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged and the king was propped up in his chariot facing the Arameans. The blood from his wound ran onto the floor of the chariot and that evening he died. As the sun was setting, a cry spread through the army, every man to his town, every man to his land. So the king died and was brought to Samaria. They buried him there. They washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria where the prostitutes bathed, and the dogs licked up his blood as the word of the Lord had declared. As for the other events of Ahab's reign, including all he did, the palace he built and adorned with ivory, and the cities he fortified, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Ahab rested with his ancestors, and Ahaziah his son succeeded him as king. That's how Ahab died. How is it clear that God was the one who controlled Ahab's death? So one, there was a prophecy from Elijah that the, the, the dogs were going to lick up Ahab's blood. And it happened exactly that way. Good. What other details? Maybe? Well, he had disguised himself so that he would not be found out. So he, he had in the back of his mind, God says I'm going to die sometime, but I'm going to keep that from happening. And so he didn't dress like a king and he disguised himself and wore a whole bunch of armor. And he still died. How so? Randomly selected. Yeah, the Bible includes that phrase at random. So... Just an archer wasn't trying to hit the king of Israel and just shot his bow at random and it happened to hit Ahab right between his armor. And that's how he died. And it's a clear example of he couldn't avoid what God said was going to happen to him. And he thought that he was in control, which he kind of did his whole life long. But in the end, God was ultimately in control and carried out his judgment against him. I think it's interesting that there's a little summary paragraph at the end of his reign. The Bible does this for all the different kings. And it mentions, just very quickly in passing, all the great things that Ahab did. Right? So we talked about how Israel was actually bigger and more powerful usually than Judah was. So what great things did Ahab accomplish? He built a big palace adorned with ivory. What else? He fortified a whole bunch of cities. Right, normally, if you think about a king's reign, that's what you would focus on, right? There'd be chapters and chapters about how he built up this city and built up this city and built this amazing palace, and the Bible lays it all out in half of a verse. Because according to the Bible, what was most important about King Ahab? His blasphemy. His blasphemy, his lack of faith. That's what God cared about. I don't care how many cities you fortify. You, you turn against me. And you let people away from me. That's what most most concerns God. Sam? Time and time again we see, are these not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Where do we find that? Yeah, so in verse 39 it's got the phrase, you can read more, right, in the annals of the kings of Israel. 
And it would seem like that was a, a history account written of the kings of Israel that doesn't survive to us. Secular today. history. Yeah, that time. that's maybe good. So Sam says, was that kind of like secular history? And we trust that what we have in the Bible is what God wanted to be written by his prophets. And there was like a secular history. King Ahab probably had court historians and he told them what to write down about his reign. And that's all recorded somewhere. But those annals we of the kings, of we don't have any of those at all. Okay. None of those at all. I believe if you go through, there's also the annals of the kings of Judah. So there was a similar thing for yeah, the kings in the south. And, again, yeah. yep. and so the, the writer of Second Kings is saying, I'm aware of those. So he's the writer of Second Kings is not claiming that this is the only account written of this time period. He said, you can check on all this stuff and this other writing and find more information there. Great point, good question. One last thing to pull from this, because it ties into our story for today, is what king of Judah did Ahab get to fight together with him? Jehoshaphat. <laughs> yeah. Which is just a fun word to say, Jehoshaphat. And uh, Jehoshaphat is actually a good king. He actually believes in God. But as we'll see again today, somehow he keeps going along with what the kings of Israel wanted to do. And I have to say, in this story, he does not present himself as a very wise person. Right? So, what does Ahab tell him to do? And what was the implication of that? You dress like a king, so they try to kill you. And I won't, so they don't kill me. And you think, that doesn't sound like a very good plan. But Jehoshaphat went along with it, and somehow God protected him and let Ahab be killed. Right, so this is the end of Ahab. He has one son who reigns, Ahaziah, but then it's in Ahaziah's lifetime that Ahab's whole family line gets killed out, and Jezebel herself gets killed, and dogs lick up her blood too, and so God's judgment was carried out on Ahab and his whole family. Yeah. What was the difference between their voices, because when he cried out, they realized he wasn't Ahab. Yeah, so how did they know when Jehoshaphat cried out that he wasn't really the king? Wanted poster. I, yeah, <laughs> the wanted poster is an Arab, so the true king of Israel, <laughs> the, the, the king of Judah. Audio recordings. Audio recordings, you know, these special forces troops that studied who their opponent was. I, I'm not sure. One might be Israel and Aram had a long history of fighting with each other. And Ahab had fought against Aram before. And so it's possible that there was actually a physical description of they knew who Ahab was and not who Jehoshaphat was, that they could tell a difference. And with bows and arrows, you still got to be fairly close. You're going to see. Right. If you're riding in a chariot. You know who you're looking for. Right. So maybe it was a physical thing that they recognized. As far as the language goes, they both would have spoken Hebrew. There are places in the Bible where there were different accents on Hebrew. You know, like North, I mean, in the United States, we speak English differently. So I mean, it's possible that he said, oh, this is a guy with a Southern accent, not a Northern accent. He's not the right one. The Lord just made him recognize. So, or maybe God helped him recognize. But I'm guessing maybe the familiarity with fighting against Israel. They, they knew who the king of Israel was. And this clearly wasn't him. They didn't? I thought maybe Jehoshaphat called out to his God. And they knew Ahab would never call on anybody to Baal or Astro. Okay. So it could be from what Jehoshaphat said. Maybe he simply said, I'm Jehoshaphat. I mean, that would be the easy answer, right? That he told them who he was. Or maybe he called out to the Lord and not to Baal or some false god. So we can speculate, but I don't know if we can say for sure. Somehow they knew this wasn't who they were seeking. You know? Well, that just goes to prove the Lord's in control. Yeah. Right? The whole thing proves the Lord's in control. Because, I mean, shooting an arrow and then going between them, the mm -hmm. armor, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty good shot not to do that. We're a pretty bad shot and just have it go <laughs> the wrong place, right? But God, God's really controlling things. Great, let's turn the page and turn ahead in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 3. And so we're going to read another kind of similar account, but it's going to have to do with Elisha. 
So we're going to read all of 2 Kings chapter 3 today. So you know, I'm taking an online class through our seminary, studying this and some of these sections in Hebrew. And I was really embarrassed a couple weeks ago because we, we, this chapter we just read in English. We didn't actually study the Hebrew for it. And I was reading it in English. And I got about five or ten verses in and I thought to myself, I don't know how this ends. And I was embarrassed because here's a chapter of the Bible that I don't, I don't remember the last time I heard the story. And so even as I was reading it, I thought, I'm not sure how this goes. And so if one of you, as we go through this, you say, oh yeah, I, I know this, I'd be surprised. <laughs> all right? But this is a great example of, there's, there's so much truth in the Bible for all of us to keep on learning and knowing. So here's the battle with Moab. We'll start just by reading the first three verses. 2 Kings chapter 3. Bless you. Joram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, he did not turn away from them. So here's how we get started. We've got Joram. There's a text note that says his name's also Jehoram. So you can see it said different ways. He becomes king of Israel. And it says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. Is that a compliment? <laughs> No, hopefully we can see, it's not really a compliment, okay? And so was Joram a good king? No, he wasn't a good king. He just wasn't quite as bad as King Ahab had been. But he wasn't actually a good king. Okay, so, so just notice that. Um, what does it say that he continued to do that was wrong? So he did get rid of a little bit of the Baal worship that Ahab and Jezebel had brought into Israel. What did he continue to, to support? It, it says the sins of Jeroboam. We talked about this last time. So somebody has to remember, right? What were the sins of Jeroboam? <coughs> it had to do with Elisha being mocked by those boys in Bethel. And we said something was bad about Bethel that maybe led the people there to be especially against God's prophet. The two golden calves. Is that golden calves? The golden calves. Jeroboam is the one who set up two golden calves and told the people of Israel to worship those golden calves. And one was way up north in Dan. The other was in Bethel. Here it's just spelled a little bit differently. And so Jeroboam was the first king of Israel and he sets up these false golden calves as idols. And from Jeroboam on, everybody worships these golden calves. And so, Joram, he doesn't propose Baal worship quite like his parents did. But he still worships golden calves and encourages people to do so. And so he's still an unbeliever and he's still against God. Make sense? So that makes me think of a passage in the Bible. Instead of comparing ourselves to other people, Jesus tells us, be holy. holy or perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so if we want to consider, well, how good am I? Whom are we supposed to compare ourselves to? God. Right? And when we compare ourselves to God, how good are we? Zero. Not good. Right? We're sinful. And so what do we constantly need from God? Forgiveness. Forgiveness and grace. Okay, and maybe we can see a little example of that here with this list of kings. Right? So Joram, well, I'm not as bad as my father was. He could honestly say that. <laughs> but did that mean anything in God's eyes? No. no. Right? The standard for being good is not be better than King Ahab. That would be setting the bar pretty low. It's 
be perfect like God is, and if we're not, then we need God's grace. Right? Our goal isn't to be less bad than someone else. Our goal is to be perfect. And that's only possible by faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus that makes us perfect. Okay, and we see that just in this little description. Jeremy wasn't as bad as his, his parents, but he still didn't have faith in God. So he was still an enemy of God. Kathy? He's still alive, yeah. So, so he bridged a couple different kings. So he fought in this battle with Ahab, and now he's going to fight in a battle with Joram. So he, he pairs up with multiple generations of kings. Good question. All right, let's keep reading. Chapter 3, starting with verse 4. Now Misha, king of Moab, raised sheep. And he had to pay the king of Israel a tribute of a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of a hundred thousand rams. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. He also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. By what route shall we attack? he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he answered. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. Okay, so we're setting up for this battle. Uh, you can see this, the places on the same map that we've been using. We've got Israel in blue, Judah's in yellow. The kingdom of Moab is over here. So this is who the enemy was. You notice, what's this big body of water between Judah and Moab? The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. So Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea from Judah. And then it also mentions Edom. Edom is down here. So you got Israel, Judah, Edom, and Moab's over here. So the king of Israel tells the king of Judah that they're going to attack Moab. And they ask, well, which way should we go? Can you notice how they would have two pretty equal options? They could go over the north of the Dead Sea through Israel. People suggest that they didn't do that because most of the, the big cities of Moab were up here in the north. And so if they came in from the north, they'd run right away into all the, the major cities. And so maybe the thought was, well, let's sneak in from the bottom, and that way we'll, we'll catch them off guard or we won't have to attack their strongest forces right away. The problem was, what is all this area down here like? Desert. It's all desert. And so they end up walking through the desert, and they run out of water, which is gonna be the problem as you go through this chapter. Any questions about all that? Why did they take a boat across? Because they would need a lot of boats, right? To transport an army across a, a body of water is easier said than done. You'd have to have boats, and if they've got horses and chariots, and it's not easy to go across a big body of water with a large army. So they're going to walk around the south. We hear that the king of Moab is named Misha, and we talked a whole bunch about Misha in our first Bible study in this in this series. Do you remember? You don't remember? And we talked about this thing. It's not the Ten Commandments. Well, that's a good guess. Is it, does it at least ring a bell that you've seen this picture before? This is called the Misha Stila. A Stila is just a big stone that has writing on it. So the Misha stone... Anybody remember what we said about this? So this is an archaeological find. It's a stone that was carved by King Misha of Moab. And this has been found by archaeologists, and it's a real thing. And King Misha of Moab, on this stone, 
describes how the country of Israel had made him pay lots of tribute, and he didn't like it, and he was going to fight against it. Does that sound familiar? That's all written on that stone. That's on that stone. In Hebrew. It's in, uh, it's in the language of the Moabites, which I'm not sure which language that was. Not in Hebrew. But it's, it's readable, and it's right on there. King Misha saying, and he doesn't use the name Ahab. He uses the name Omri, who was the father of Ahab. That the kingdom of Omri, and sometimes a dynasty was just known by the first king in that dynasty. So the, this country of, uh, of Omri, they've, they've oppressed us. And I, Misha, are gonna are gonna break against this oppression. And it's all right here on this on the stone that they found. I think it's in the in Paris in the Louvre Art Museum. You can go there and see the stone. Again, we don't need archaeological evidence for us to believe that the Bible's true. But it is kind of cool when there's archaeological evidence that matches up exactly with what the Bible tells us. Okay, and people will say, well, how come? Obviously, Moab's going to lose in this battle. I don't want to spoil the story, but God's people are going to win. And people, well, why didn't he write on the stone that they actually lost the battle? And you think, what king makes a big stone and says, I lost the big battle? Okay, that doesn't, no king does that. Okay, and so usually when you find archaeological evidence from the Old Testament from other countries, it matches up with what the Bible says, except it doesn't. It doesn't finish the story. It doesn't say, oh, and the God of Israel completely humiliated me and my army. That doesn't make it on there. Ready? So how should we address the uh, Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls? That's a good question. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're not connected with this, but they're found in, in this region of Judah that's by the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls are actually an excellent, excellent thing for anybody who believes in the Bible. Because before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest complete copy that we had of the Old Testament was from the year 1000. AD so, AD, 1000 AD. So 1000 AD is pretty old, right? That's a thousand years ago. But when was the last book of the Old Testament written? 400 BC. 400 BC. So the oldest complete copy we had of the Old Testament was. 1,400 years after the last book of the Old Testament was written. It's a lot of numbers. Are you following that? Yeah. So people who don't believe in the Bible, they criticize, and they continue to do, but they, they criticize, well, you know, how do you even know you have the right thing? The Old Testament copy you have is 1,400 years after when it was written, and certainly it got corrupted and changed, and it's not really the Word of God anymore. You see how people would say that? So then suddenly in 1948, some Bedouin shepherds just playing around in the caves in the desert found these old scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're from before the time of Jesus and they have lots of different writings, but included in the Dead Sea Scrolls is many scrolls of books of the Old Testament. And so now suddenly, instead of going back to 1000 AD, we have the book of Isaiah from 100 BC. And when scholars compare them, 100 BC to the scroll we had from 1000 AD, they are miraculously similar. That the text of God's Word didn't change, even though it was copied over and over again through hundreds of years, it, it didn't change. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls have actually been a huge blessing so we who believe in the Bible, it gives us older copies of some of the books of the Old Testament than we ever had before. And it shows that even though we have older copies, it's exactly the same as what we had anyways. That God has very carefully preserved his word. And so we can be thankful for archaeology, finding things like this. And finding, uh, like this Misha Stephen. One thing to be careful about is, um, I hear... Sometimes a better way to describe the Dead Sea Scrolls is to call them the Dead Sea Scraps. <laughs> because it's not as though we have these huge, perfectly preserved manuscripts. Often it was, you know, a jar that had some scraps in it. I mean, it's 2,000 years old. And so we have to be a little careful to, you know, to say too much about it. But 
from using those scraps and the, the complete manuscripts that were there, it really shows God's preserved his word, just like he said he would. Great questions. Archaeology's kind of cool. So now you're going to remember King Misha, right? Yes. And the Misha ceiling. I just thought it was interesting. How much did he have to pay the king of Israel every year? 100,000 lambs. 100,000 lambs. That's a lot, right? You could see why he didn't like that. And so he's going to rebel. And you could see why the king of Israel didn't want that to stop. No, I want you to keep giving me all that. And so we're going to fight. Ready to go on? So Israel and Judah and Edom are in the, the middle of the desert and they have no water. And what's going to happen? Verse 10. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Jehoshaphat asked, the word of the, or Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Elisha said to the king of Israel, Why do you want to involve me? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to deliver us into the hands of Moab. Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you. Let's stop there for a second. So we've got this predicament. They're traveling through the desert with these huge armies, and they run out of water. And maybe we could say this, this was not a very smart thing on their part, right? And we see even today that if you're going to attack somebody else, but you don't have your supply chains all taken care of, it doesn't work out very well. Okay, and so this was a mistake that these kings had made not to prepare for this journey through the desert. Everybody knew that it was desert that they were traveling through. So they got no water for their, their forces. And when King Joram of Israel realizes this, whom does he immediately blame? God. God! Who he doesn't believe in. Who he doesn't believe in. <laughs> and so immediately when something goes wrong, Joram says, well, the Lord... He's the one who made us come out here and do this, and now he hasn't given us water. Right? In our, our Faith Builders class, when we talk about sin, we read a passage from the book of Proverbs that says, A man's own folly ruins his life, but his heart rages against the Lord. And that passage reminds us that whose fault is it when we mess up our lives? Ours. Ours, and who do we like to blame for it? God, and we see Joram doing that. And we see a difference, though, with Jehoshaphat. So he said Jehoshaphat is a true believer in God, and there should be a difference between believers in God and unbelievers, right? And so faced with this predicament, what does Jehoshaphat say? Basically, can we ask God? Let's ask God, which is a great answer, right? Joram is throwing up his hands, well, God's going to try to destroy us because he's bad. And Jehoshaphat says, no, let's, let's find a prophet of God, of the Lord, a true prophet, and ask him what we should do. I just think it's great to see how, how that contrast is played out. So what prophet of God did they find? Elisha. Elisha. Something that we can't explain is, somehow Elisha was there, right? Which, other than, you know, God must have told them, you know, take along as these armies go to attack Moab. Because again, he's, he's far away. Elisha lives way up here, and somehow Elisha's down here with these kings, and I think the only answer is God knew that his services would be needed. And so they find Elisha. Okay, we're going to talk to him. And what does Elisha say to the king of Israel? Go to your own gods. Go to your own gods. I've got on the page three at the top, it says, sometimes people ask if there's sarcasm in the Bible. We really like sarcasm today, don't we, in our world. 
And people kind of search for why, you know, I hope there's some sarcasm in the Bible. I think this would be a place where you could say there's some sarcasm in the Bible. Right? Can you imagine Elisha's voice as he says this? Joram says, all right, Elisha, what should we do? And Elisha says, go ask your own gods. Right? Why are you talking to me? Right? Knowing full well that King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's gods were real gods, but you don't believe in God anyways. If your gods are so much better, then just go talk to them. Right? So it's, it's pretty sarcastic, but it's meant to be because Joram is this faithless king Next question says, notice the frightening implication of Elijah's, Elisha's words. It's possible to place yourself beyond the point of hearing the word of God. How might that happen? So according to Elisha, what was the only reason he was going to talk to Joram? <coughs> because of Jehoshaphat. And so because there was this believing godly king, Elisha says, Joram, I have nothing to do with you. But for the sake of this godly king, I'll talk with you. Right? Think of what he was saying to Joram. That Joram, you, you put yourself outside of hearing the word of God. I don't have any message to say to you. And that's a pretty frightening thing, isn't it? Okay, so I say, how, how might that happen in our lives? Or how might that happen in a person's life? Dave, you had your hand up. Well, there's many examples of how they worked hard to serve people's hearts when they continue to refuse to believe, such as the Pharaoh. Uh, yeah. Using illustrations like it happened in, mm -hmm. in our own lives, if we continue to reject God and continue to commit to sin. So, a good example in the Bible, or a bad example in the Bible, would be Pharaoh in Egypt. And God sent Moses to him and did all the plagues and Pharaoh just refused and refused and refused and refused to believe. And so finally God said, okay, then you just won't believe. Okay, this is a, a frightening thing, but it was part of the implications of when Ahab and his family turned against God, it's not okay, right? We kind of make it, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever God you believe in. No. Uh, when Joram turned against God, it led God to say, well, why, why should I speak to you when you're not going to listen to me? Yeah? There's, this happens in the movies all the time. People have their life going on just great, and then mm -hmm. something horrible happens. And it's not that they've come to faith, it's that they say, God, if you're up there. Good you know, example. it's as if, I don't need you any other time, but now that I need you... Mm -hmm. And so Nada says, you see this in movies all the time, that somebody who hasn't been a religious person at all comes onto some troubling times, and then in a desperate moment, they, they look up to the sky and they say, God, if you're up there, you better do something. You got me into this, so do something about it. And does God hear that prayer? No. Well, God says he doesn't hear the prayers of those who don't, who don't pray with faith. Okay, and so this is not a, a gospel message, right? This is the, the law of God. But when a person rejects God and his word, over and over again, God says, fine, I'll give you what you want. If you don't want to hear my word, then I'll let you not hear my word. It's just that's a, that's a harsh judgment on somebody. Dave? Just an opinion question. Do you think that Nebuchadnezzar's heart was Another example is Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, and God did all sorts of great things to him. We don't really know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar seemed, he kind of recognized God's hand working in his life, but it's hard to tell if he recognized God as the only God or just one of many gods. And We're not told that Nebuchadnezzar's heart was ever hard, but he's another example of somebody who kind of comes back and forth seeing the truth and falling away and seeing the truth and again the Bible's message was when God calls you to repent then repent because ultimately God gives us what we want which is to not have God as part of our lives example I read in the commentary is kind of what Nada said but it's that quote that's on your study sheet it said God is simply the airbag in the disasters of life which you hope you never have to use <laughs> if that is your pattern you may be placing yourself beyond the help of God's Word. 
And I thought that was a good way to put it. If you and I treat God like an airbag, like, well, you know, it's nice to have him stuck here in this little compartment, but I hope he never comes out. Um, then we shouldn't be surprised when God, when that doesn't come out, right? When God doesn't allow us to hear his word. But as hard as that is to hear, it made me think of something that's really good. So Elisha says to Dora, I will speak to you, but only because of someone else. That's exactly what God says to you and me. How is that similar to what God says to you and me? Because I'll talk to Jesus. Yeah, when we pray to God, why is it that God listens? Because of Jesus. We don't deserve it, right? But there's somebody else who's always with us, who's always on our side, I've got that in the little box on your page, the Christ connection. Jorah didn't deserve to even hear God's word. He received that blessing because of another faithful Jehoshaphat. In the same way, you and I don't deserve any blessings from God. We receive God's blessings because of another Jesus. Because Jesus died for us and rose for us, God showers his blessings on us, just like he showered grace to Jorah for Jehoshaphat's sake. Can you see a little connection there with, with Jesus? That it's because of Jesus that God hears our prayers and God gives his word to us. You think, what a blessing it is. We have someone kind of like good King Joshua on our side. That even in our worst moments, Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus shares God's word with us. That's what Christ does for you and me. Which is why Jehoshaphat's kind of stupid and tags along with the other guy because God wanted him to. So the big question is, why does Jehoshaphat keep fighting battles with the bad kings of Israel? And I, nobody really knows. Um, it seems like Jehoshaphat has this in his mind. We really still are all God's people. So if you notice, we didn't mention it, but in verse 7, the end of verse 7, so... Joram asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight? And he says, I will go with you. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. And you wonder, did Jehoshaphat just still have this in his mind? We're, we are still all God's people. We're all Israel. And as wicked and bad as these kings are, they're still leading God's people. And so I'm willing to, to go with them to fight. We don't know. We don't know what his motivation was. But clearly, God was using him. Israel are going to overthrow, overthrow Part of it might have just been strategic, too, that it's nice to have Israel above us for everyone to attack Israel, and then they don't attack us. So let's keep having Israel there. Great points. But see what actually happened. This is the part that, like I said, I, I got this far. What, is, what does God do? Let's see. So starting with verse 15. Elisha's talking. He says, but now bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came on Elisha, and he said, This is what the Lord says. I will fill this valley with pools of water. For this is what the Lord says. You won't see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water. You and your cattle and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. The next morning, about the time for offering the sacrifice, there was water flowing from the direction of Eden, and the land was filled with water. Now all the Moabites had heard that the kings had come to fight against them, so every man, young and old, who could bear arms was called up and stationed on the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. To the Moabites across the way, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to the plunder, Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and fought them until they fled. And the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. They destroyed the towns and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. They stopped up all the springs and cut down every good tree. Only Kir Harasheth was left with its stones in place. But men armed with slings surrounded it and attacked it. So 
so on. And I know I spoiled the story already when I said, God's people are going to win. But it's pretty amazing what, what God does. So they're, they're thirsty in the desert. And what does God decide to do? He just brings water. And it's kind of odd that he just brings it. Right? It didn't rain. There was no big thunderstorms. But suddenly, water flowed into the land. How was that a direct attack on Baal? Do you remember who Baal was? The God of fertility, but especially of rain and thunder. And so who really brings the water? The Lord does. Right? And so if suddenly there's a big thunderstorm, King Joram should have said, well, yeah, you prayed to the Lord, but Baal's the one who actually answered. But when God just brings springs of water, Baal wasn't the one who did that. This is the Lord who provided for his people. Notice the phrase, it said, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. Miraculously providing water was a piece of cake. What else would God do? He gave them great victory over the whole country of Moab. So remember, what was their prayer? What did they pray to God? Lord, we need water. And isn't it just a great response? God said, that's too easy. Right? I'll make water miraculously show up in the desert, but come on. you got to ask for more than that. I'll also give you great victory over your enemies. Okay, remember how we said they didn't want to come in from the north because there were all these big fortified cities. Where does it sound like the battle actually took place? In the desert. And it actually happens that God fools the Moabites and that they actually foolishly attack completely unprepared. And so even though they're in the Moabites' country, the Israelites are the ones who are all set up, ready to fight, and they completely destroy the Moabite army, and they take over all of their towns. And just this, this promise of God, you know, giving you water in the middle of the desert, that's just too little. i got to do more than that. And then he completely delivered the Moabites into their hands. One thing you can do when you're, you study the Bible is when you, when you find kind of a unique phrase like that, is to, to try to search, where else would this show up in the Bible? I did that last week in my sermon. You all remember that? You know, we talked about things being impossible, and it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? And that's kind of a, that's a pretty unique phrase. And so you ask yourself, where else in the Bible does God say he can do impossible things? Where's another place where he says he can do that? Well, hold on, We're, you're jumping ahead. Do you remember where else in the Bible God says nothing is impossible with God? Just, the birth of Jesus with Mary. Okay, can you see that? This is, a, this is one way to study the Bible. When you find this interesting word or phrase, Look up, where else does this same phrase show up? Because there's probably a connection there. So this idea that there's something that's too easy for God, it shows up in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. And here's what it says. It says, Now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. Who's talking here? Not Isaiah. Who is it whom God sent to bring his people back together and save them? Jesus. This is Jesus talking in the Old Testament. Jesus is talking. He says, so God is talking to Jesus now. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And so here, Jesus was talking about how he's going to be God's servant and then God the Father says to Jesus, it's too small a thing. What was too small a thing? Saving only the Jews. So God says to Jesus, if, if I send you and you, you just bring back the, the people of the Jews, that's too small. I'm going to do way more than that. 
What else was God going to do? Yeah, who are the Gentiles? Us. Anybody who's not a Jew, God says it's too small of a thing to have Jesus just be the Savior of the Jewish nation. I'm going to make you, Jesus, a light to the ends of the earth and all sorts of people who right now seem way outside the kingdom of God. You're going to bring them into my kingdom too. Isn't that kind of a cool thing? Right? Just this phrase, it's too small of a thing. And so God, please give us some water here in the desert. And God says, well, you, I can do more than that. Right? I'll bring water and I'll give you a great military victory. And, you know, the Jewish people were saying, God, just save us. And God says, no, that's too small. I'm not just going to save you. I'm going to send a Savior who's going to bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay, so even that little phrase, it makes us think about what Jesus did for us. Maybe. It makes me think of another phrase that we hear in the Bible, is my arm too short? Excellent. So there's places where God says, is my arm too short to save? Where the prophets will say, is God's arm too short? That's a great connection. That'd be another phrase to look up. Where does that show up? And see what connections there are. But God's arm is not too short. Somebody say, well, how long is his arm? Right? Is it, you know, what coat size would, would God wear? And, it's not the point, right? But God can do so much more than what we think that God can do. Right? Turn to the last page in your study sheet. There's just one more verse on the top. John 1, 16. Out of his fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. And so it's this, this idea, instead of giving us what we deserve, Instead of giving us the bare minimum, God gives us more. Gives us more. Makes us overflow. We talked a month ago about a God of abundance. God abundantly blesses us. Okay, he could have, you know, just given them each one little plastic water bottle in the desert. All right, do you want water? Here's a couple cases of water. Instead he has water flow in and fill the land. And got a God of abundance. The story doesn't actually end there, though. And it has a really strange ending. So we're going to read the last couple verses and see if we can understand what happens here. So we're to verse 26. When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. Then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. The fury against Israel was great and they withdrew and returned to their own land. Okay, I said this is really strange. The first part isn't strange. So they're losing the battle. So King Misha gets 700 of his best men and say, we're going to break through and they can't. That part we get. But the last verse, it's really unexpected. So what does the king do in his desperation? He sacrifices his son to his God. And it makes a point to mention, this is his, his firstborn son, the one who's supposed to be the next king. He sacrifices him to his God. Here's the extra credit question today. Anybody know what the God of Moab was called? Shemosh. Yeah, Shemosh. C H E. M-O-S-H Chemosh or Chemosh that was the name of the god of the Moabites and so he offers up a human sacrifice to the god of the Moabites and then the story ends by saying the fury against Israel was great they withdrew and returned to their own land and what's difficult to understand is it doesn't tell us whose fury was great <laughs> and so the Israelites are winning this resounding victory. They're just crushing the Moabites on all sides. The king of Moab sacrifices his son to their pagan god. Suddenly, the fury against Israel is great, and all the Israelites go back home. And so the question is, whose fury was great? And I don't know what the answer is. 
So Bible commentaries, just to give you an eye into what Bible commentaries, just think, well, whose theory could this be? And they give four options. And number one, they could say that maybe it was God's fury, the fury of the Lord. And so the Lord, of course, hates human sacrifices. And so when the king of Moab offers his son, the Lord just, he says, get out of here. And he sends all the Israelites home. Problem with that is, why would the Lord send the Israelites home when the Moabites are the ones who offer the human sacrifice? You'd expect the fear of the Lord to be against the Moabites, and then the Israelites just win a big, even bigger victory, right? Some Bible scholars say the fury was actually the fury of Chemosh. And when the king of Moab sacrificed his son to Chemosh, Chemosh was so angry that in his anger he forced the Israelites to leave. Hopefully you see a problem with that. What would be the problem that you see with that? Shema doesn't exist. This is where, just realize, Christian theologians today don't all believe in Christ or in the Bible. And so there are people with the title of Christian theologians say, well, this makes perfect sense. Chemosh saw the sacrifice and he drove the Israelites off. You say, no, that doesn't make sense. They can't work. Right? The third option would be that the Moabites themselves got greatly inspired by the sacrifice and their fury at what was happening led them to fight more fiercely and drive the Israelites away. So maybe that's what happened, right? This was kind of like the big motivational factor and the fury of the Moabites drove the Israelites off. Except the, all the fighting men are dead by now. It just, you know, the whole is, it seems like many of their men have died. There's not much left and there would be quite a turn of events for that to happen. And the fourth suggestion is that the Israelites were furious and that the Israelites just wanted nothing to do with human sacrifice and when they saw this happening, they just said, this is, we're getting out of here. You can keep this one little city, fine, we'll come back another day. But this is so wrong that we're just leaving. Okay, I think all four of those options, you can think of holes in them. And so I can't stand up here today and tell you which one is really true. And sometimes this happens in the Bible. That we know the Bible's true, what it says is right. But we don't always have every little bit of information that we might need to know exactly what it's talking about. And so, somehow, this event, this human sacrifice, was such a, a, a drastic thing that it caused the Israelites to leave. And they didn't finish the work of conquering this last Moabite city. Dave? Just a question. When it says Israelites, is it referring to those from Israel and Judah, or Samaria and Judah, or the whole? Good. It seems like it's talking about the whole united army. Israel, Judah, and Edom. Um, you notice it showed up in uh, verse 24. It says the Moabites came to the camp of Israel and the Israelites rose up and fought them off. We know it's, I mean, this is, it's a united camp, but it's really a story dealing most of all with Israel and Elisha as the prophet to Israel. So Israel is referred to speaking of this whole group. Yeah? This probably is just way out there, but what it makes me feel like is that the Moabites were so badly beaten and so you know they had filled up all of their fields they had they had destroyed all of this stuff they were just so furious there was just no hope for them and so Israel just said we've done enough right so Nada says just things were so bad for Moab and things were so desperate and then this child sacrifice and Israel just says well let's just it's enough has happened here um, I don't know. Okay? I think we have to sometimes with the Bible say, well, I'm going to learn what's going on here, but I maybe don't have all the answers that I want to know. So instead of completely finishing the victory, the Israelites go back. I want to stand, though, just thinking a little more about this, this really sad thing of offering your son to your God. If you look in the box at the bottom, there's one more connection to Jesus. 
Since the God of the Bible is so different than any other God, in order to see God and his salvation, King Misha needed to sacrifice his son. So the way that King Misha's God worked is if he wanted his God to really pay attention to him, he had to sacrifice his son. In contrast, God sought us and our salvation by sacrificing his son. God gave up his own son. Do you see a difference? It's completely different. Okay, Moabite religion said, well, if you want to get God's attention, you better start burning your children in fire. And maybe God will listen. And the God of the Bible says, no, 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 no. For you to come close to me, I'm going to give up my one and only son, Jesus. And it's through Jesus that you come to me, not through offering your children. Right? God... God's way is so much better. Right? The bottom verse there, Deuteronomy 4, What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him? The Israelites recognize this. There is something so different about our God than every other God. And hopefully we recognize that today too. There's something different about the God of the Bible than the God of any other religion. One last illustration, I just saw in my, my news feed on my phone, there was an article about how archaeologists have found recently a child sacrifice in Argentina, on one of the Andes Mountains. And it was from the ancient Incas, who also sacrificed their children to the gods. And archaeologists were really amazed and excited because this girl was sacrificed at like 18,000 feet of elevation, and so her body froze and so it's perfectly preserved. And so there's this frozen girl just still in the same position for the last hundreds of years. And you just see that, and now they've thought her out and they're studying her body and just say, isn't that sad? That somehow this made sense. And what's just so sad is how the article's written to explain why. Well, actually, the Incas, they were really, they were really kind people. And it seems like they gave this girl some coca leaves, which must have helped numb the suffering that she faced. And so they were thinking about what was good for her. And it was great that this people was so, they were, they were more advanced than we give them credit for to do such care. And the fact that it was up so high, maybe, maybe she froze to death, but before she was even sacrificed. And wouldn't that be a more humane way to die? <laughs> and you just say, no. There's nothing humane about this at all. You can't rationalize that. That you that. can't. You're offering, you're offering your child to try to get God to listen to you. This is so wrong, right? And just as Christians realize the Bible's message is completely different. You don't have to sacrifice your children to God because God sacrificed his son for you. And it's through faith in Jesus that we go to God. And what a wonderful thing that is to know God's grace. We got to stop there. Come back next time. There are a lot of cool stories about Elisha. How many of you, as we were reading this story, could honestly say, I know how this is going to finish. Yeah, I think so, right? So this is all God's Word, and so much in here we can learn from. And I think it's exciting to study things that you don't know that well from the Bible. Let's go with a prayer. Dear Lord God, we're thankful that this chapter was written into your Word. Uh, Lord, we're a little bit embarrassed that we didn't know it very well. And that reminds us how much we want to keep on studying and, and growing in our knowledge of what you say. Lord, in your Word, we see some really bad examples, but they actually teach us about you. We see how, just like Joram, we need someone else to be our intercessor with you. And that's Jesus. We don't deserve to have you hear us, but you do because of Jesus and what he's done for us. We also saw how it was a small thing for you to miraculously provide water in the desert. Just like it was a small thing for you to have Jesus just to save one group of people. You sent him to be the Savior of the world. We're thankful because that includes us and that motivates us to, to share your word with others. Finally, Lord, the story ended with this sad account of this king sacrificing his child to a false god. We're thankful that that's not what you ask us to do. Instead, you sent your son Jesus to be our Savior. 
pray that you help each one of us to continue to grow in our understanding of your grace, to keep on growing in our, our trust in you, and to recognize what a blessing it is to have you as our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.